Now on Inside California Politics, allegations of fraud, a growing backlog, and a freeze on new claims. I'm really worried that that might be too little too late. The dire warning from this lawmaker about California's broken unemployment system. Targeted by conspiracy. More than a thousand death threats. Here, this state senator set the record straight on the legislation that put him in the crosshairs of QAnon. And Supreme Court showdown. What's next if the Democrats can't stop the president's nominee? Broadcasting across the Golden State, this is Inside California Politics. We start with California's troubled employment development department. About 1.6 million unemployment claims remain unresolved. Now new claims have been paused. Thanks for joining us for Inside California Politics. I'm Frank Buckley in Los Angeles. And I'm Nikki Lorenzo in Sacramento. That pause comes after a strike team commissioned by Governor Newsom released its much anticipated report. In it are several reforms that EDD leadership is now vowing to fix. We are joined now by State Assembly Member David Chu. Mr. Chu, thanks so much for being here on Inside California Politics. We appreciate it. So let's talk about the EDD. It is under the microscope once again. We have this reset going on where we have this two weeks where no new claims are going to be processed. Do you think this is a step in the right direction to improving things at the EDD? Well, for months, it's been an incredibly frustrating situation for so many Californians who are desperately awaiting benefits, who are uh, depleting their life savings, going into extreme debt, having trouble putting food at the table, paying for rent. And now this news that there's going to be a two-week pause uh, has been very frustrating. That being said, what EDD uh, is planning to do is to implement new technologies that will hopefully help guard against both fraud and make it easier for Californians to receive their benefits. Uh, given the track record, uh, not really sure to what to expect, but we are hopeful that this is going to improve the situation. Okay, so we're talking over a million claims, more than 1.5 million claims backlogged. You also mentioned implementing new technology. Two weeks seems like kind of an unrealistic timeline. Well, it's two weeks just to put in place new technologies that will help guard against fraud and to help move new claims forward. Uh, but the 1.6 million claims that have not yet been resolved, uh, the administration has said it's going to take until the end of January to get that fixed. And from my perspective, I'm really worried that that might be too little too late for so many desperate Californians that need help getting through this pandemic and this recession. All right, so let's talk about how the strike teams uh, report was released. In the political world and political reporting world, we often are very familiar with the phrase the Friday dump. News comes out, documents come out, hoping that it won't get the attention because of the day and time of the week. This was a Saturday night dump. Late Saturday night, this news of what the strike team found came out. Do you think that this was handled properly or should the governor held a press conference on a Monday or even a Friday and said, look, this is what this is what we found out? Well, it was a bit surprising to get the information late on a Saturday night. That being said, the strike team deserves real credit for taking on this very difficult task of how to turn around a broken agency. The report confirmed what the legislature has been saying for many months. It documents in great detail all the ways in which EDD has been failing California and failing constituents it's supposed to be serving. Uh, in 109 pages, it lays out over 100 recommendations uh, that probably should have been implemented not just six months ago, but 10 years ago during the Great Recession when EDD system crashed the last time. And uh, and we need to implement all these things. But, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the report that the strike team put out is incredibly important because it gives us a roadmap. Uh, hopefully EDD is at its lowest point uh, and hopefully with these recommendations we can move it forward, but it remains to be seen how quickly they'll get implemented. So we had a conversation about a month ago when there was some complications with the EDD. This has really been going on since the pandemic started. And look, nobody could have predicted something like this and the state of California had to react immediately and there was a lot of need. But I asked you before, do you think amid all of this, should the head of the EDD step down? You said no about a month ago. Do you still feel that way? 
You know, clearly, uh, all of us are incredibly frustrated with the slow pace of reform being driven by EDD leadership. I have had some colleagues that have called for her to step down. From my perspective, this past weekend, when the strike team report came out, she immediately said that she and her team would immediately implement all the recommendations. They need to be done, uh, and uh, and I think in short order, if they're not, there should be a real conversation about what EDD leadership means moving forward. Ultimately, it's a decision of Governor Newsom, uh, but we need accountability, we need transparency, and we need EDD to start working again. Can Governor Newsom and his administration be doing more at this point? Well, we have provided the administration with all of the resources and budget that they have asked for. Uh, EDD has the capacity to hire up to 5,000 plus new employees to staff the phone lines and process the 1.6 million claims that are out there. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, the Newsom administration needs to be doing everything they can to rehaul and modernize that IT system, ensure that they're appropriately deploying staffing, uh, put in all the safeguards that we need to guard against fraud, and to make sure that people are getting paid as quickly as they possibly can. We need uh, the level of urgency that meets the moment and uh, addresses the, the struggling Californians who are dealing with this pandemic and this recession. I heard that sigh there. I can hear the frustration in your voice because this is really a time when folks rely on government and they need government to work for them. And this is when they get frustrated because it appears that it's not. As someone who believes that government can and should work for the people, this has been a remarkably frustrating chapter. Uh, the report highlighted that uh, our constituents were making literally millions of calls to EDD call centers that weren't being picked up. And in fact, the report said uh, that on average, only one out of a thousand constituents that were trying to reach EDD during critical time periods were able to get through. That's not what government should be about. Uh, we shouldn't have a situation where if you are, are, are due benefits uh, because your employer has paid into the system over the years, you can't get them. You're waiting for months, uh, waiting to figure out how to pay for food on the table or pay for your rent. We need to get folks help as quickly as possible. And uh, the slow pace at which this agency has been responding and failing to fundamentally reform their business has been heartbreaking and incredibly frustrating. We will have to leave it there. Assembly Member David Chu, we thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Next on Inside California Politics, a California lawmaker receives graphic death threats after his bill surrounding the sex offender registry is signed into law. Senator Scott Weiner describes the vitriol sent his way and who was behind it. A California state senator is experiencing the effects of a full-scale attack by the conspiracy theory group QAnon. They've gone after Senator Scott Weiner with dangerous and often false claims, including death threats, after the passage and signing of SB 145, which eliminates an inequality in who must register for the sex offender list and gives judges more say in the matter. Opponents claim the law normalizes pedophilia. Joining us now, Senator Scott Weiner. Senator, before we talk about those vicious and, and dangerous attacks on you, what do you say to this charge that comes not just from QAnon followers, but others who say SB 145 somehow normalizes pedophilia? What does it actually do? Yeah, so the, um, <clears throat> this uh, false information about SB 145, it does not in any way legalize or, or normalize pedophilia. That's just false. Uh, and unfortunately, that it is coming, it's from QAnon and from its enablers like Donald Trump Jr. and Ted Cruz uh, and uh, others. Uh, and so that spreads around and then people get inaccurate information. Uh, SB 145 is a leg legislation that ends discrimination against LGBTQ young people on the sex offender registry. All it does is it says in situations where co college age and high school age kids are having sex with one another, uh, that we wanna treat LGBTQ young people the same exact way that we have treated straight young people since 1944, which is to let the judge decide and the DA decide if the person should register as a sex offender. This law 
was literally written by law enforcement. The district attorneys and the police chiefs support it. The Los Angeles DA wrote it, and it's supported by uh, the rape crisis centers, by children advocates, and by civil rights organizations like Equality California. And yet, as you mentioned, Donald Trump Jr. is among those who has uh, attacked it and attacked you. He uh, tweeted, the state of California and Democrats are both normalizing pedophilia. When you are attacked in that way, can you give us a sense of how it affects you in your everyday life? Well, it's really, it's tragic. When you have people who have a platform like a Donald Trump Jr. or a Ted Cruz or a Rush Limbaugh or Kimberly Guilfoyle, because they're all doing it, and when they make things up, this law, it does not legalize anything. Whatever is statutory rape today will remain statutory rape when this law goes into effect. It doesn't change the punishment. Whatever the jail time or probation is will remain the same. It simply says that we're going to treat LGBT and straight young people the same in, in deciding who has to register as a sex offender. But the damage that these people are causing is it with with the way social media is, is it just flies across the Internet. So Donald Trump or or whoever else, some right wing media uh, outlet will say this legalizes pedophilia or normalizes pedophilia or reduces the punishment for pedophilia, all of which is false, but it just spreads like wildfire. And so I have uh, my social media was overwhelmed with QAnon people, but also people who just see things uh, appear on their social media timeline uh, and they believe it. And so there and so we got uh, tens of thousands of comments uh, attacking me and um, calling me horrible things. A lot of them anti-Semitic or homophobic, um, more than a thousand death threats, uh, messages, phone calls uh, saying they were going to decapitate me and send my head to my mother. Um, talking about all the terrible things they were going to do to me, even threatening my parents uh, and referring to them. Uh, it's very, it's hard. I'm, a, I'm an elected official. I'm used to the rough and tumble of politics. I have very thick skin, um, but I, I'll, I would be lying if I said that this doesn't get to you. Uh, it's not the way we, we should be practicing politics. We can disagree, um, but it should never come to this. When it is this vicious and when literally lives are at threat, does it chill you in terms of thinking the next time about legislation that could broach a subject that might make people crazy? It, it, it doesn't, not, not for me. My personality, my, I'm wired in a way where I can deal uh, with that. I've had hard pieces of legislation before where I've been attacked. Uh, and I didn't run for office to have 100% approval ratings. Um, I ran for office to try to do good work, make people's lives better, so that when I hit my expiration date as an elected official, because we all do eventually, I can know that I left the world in a better place than where I found it. Senator Weiner also talked about the impact these attacks have had on LGBTQ youth. You can find our full interview with Senator Weiner online. Up next, the Republican power play. Are the Democrats powerless to stop President Trump's Supreme Court pick? We talk strategy with a pair of experts inside the bullpen. The death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has caused a, quite a stir in Washington and beyond just weeks away from the election. Joining us now, CNN chief national correspondent John King and anchor of CNN's Inside Politics, or as he might assert, the original Inside Politics, and Loyola Law School professor Jessica Levinson, director of the law school's Public Service Institute. Uh, welcome to Inside the Bullpen to both of you. Um, John, we should say that uh, Jessica and I are both in Los Angeles, so we're going to call this the Dodger, Dodgers bullpen, uh, not the Red Sox bullpen, and we hope you don't mind. Red Sox don't have a bullpen, so you're just fine. <laughs> um, all right, let me, let me start with you, John. The Republicans refused to hold a hearing, much less a vote, on President Obama's Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland. That was I think 11 months before the election, because they said it was too close to the election. Uh, they're now plunging ahead with uh, President Trump's nominee two months 
uh, before the election. Um, where you grew up in, uh, in, in Dorchester in Boston, and I grew up in 29 Palms, they might call that a double standard, maybe hypocrisy. What do they call that in Washington? A power play. Uh, look, the Republicans say the difference this time is that they have a Republican president, not a Democratic president. But you're right. Uh, but just throw that away. Just It's a waste of time to dwell on it because Mitch McConnell doesn't operate that way. Donald Trump doesn't operate that way. Mitch McConnell does not care. He sees a chance here, Frank, uh, to do what he's always wanted to do, have a conservative court majority, three Trump justice of, justices in one term on the Supreme Court, a 6-3 conservative majority, plus the dozens of district court judges and appeals court judges. Our grandchildren will be talking about this anyway, even if President Trump doesn't get this pick, but it looks like it's on a fast track. What does that mean? Obamacare's at risk. Roe v. Wade, maybe not at risk, but at risk of being eroded or dialed back some. Marriage equality, we can go on and on. Business regulation, the Republicans are worried. President Trump may lose. They may lose control of the Senate. This is their opportunity to get this done. They are going to get it done. Professor Levinson, whatever you may think of a double standard or hypocrisy or whatever you call it, Senate Republicans say they are well within the law to do this. John King suggests, I think, that they are as well. Do you agree? Absolutely. Uh, President Trump is well within the law to nominate someone to fill this vacancy, and Senate Republicans are well within the law to say uh, we are going to fast track this. We're going to have confirmation hearings if they want to. That's not in the Constitution. And then we will vote on this person. I suspect that the vacancy will be filled before Halloween. And there's nothing in the Constitution or federal law to prevent it. Again, the only pressure, really, the only question is what I view as this kind of shameful double standard. But it is absolutely true that the American public elects a president for the full four-year term with all the powers and duties that go along with it. It's not three years for federal judges and then four years for everything else. So Democrats really don't have any legal weapons in their, uh, in their arsenal here. Well, John, do you agree with that? When you talk to folks as staffers and, and lawmakers in Washington and in, in the halls of, of power, are they strategizing? Do they think that maybe they do have a play? They don't have any play in terms of math. They don't have the votes to stop this, that they've changed the rules. 51 votes gets Mitch McConnell his way in the Senate. And right now it looks increasingly clear, almost certain, uh, that he has those votes. The Democrats' only hope is that the president's nominee makes some grave error during what we expect to be three days of public confirmation hearings. The nominee will probably only testify at one or two of those hearings. So, But if the nominee performs acceptably, you can set your own standard. People with their own politics will set their own standard. But if the nominee doesn't lose any Republican votes, then the nominee goes through. So what does the Democrats play? They hope for public opinion uh, to frighten Republicans back from this. But again, Mitch McConnell doesn't care about the polls. Uh, most of the Senate Republicans he needs here are not in vulnerable races this time. There are a few Senate Republicans for whom this could be a, you know, in politics, a life or death decision. But Republicans already know they may lose control of the chamber, Frank. So that is it. They're in that tunnel. This is our chance to exercise this power. We're going to bull forward and do this. It's one of the reasons they're telling the president, pick somebody you trust, pick somebody who you know can handle the confirmation process. The Democrats hope for some public opinion backlash. But their only real hope, Frank, is they expect to lose this. They expect the president to get this justice. That is a generation of change on the United States Supreme Court. To some extent, we're already seeing that the Democrats raised and, and progressive causes raised over $90 million in 28 hours after the announcement of, of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This is Jessica certainly energized the Democratic side. Do you see as much energy on the Republican side or as John is suggesting, they've decided let's just go all in right here and forget whatever happens after this uh, confirmation process? I think both sides are actually very energized. So I agree with everything that John said. So Republicans, I think, have just been better about being efficient at filling the federal judiciary. And they know that senators can come and go, uh, representatives can come and go, and frankly, so can presidents. But if you can get that solid six to three majority in the Supreme Court, I mean, that is a conservative legacy for decades to come. John, finally, you and I are old enough to know there was a time in, in Washington, there was a civility, there, there was a sense of tradition, especially in the body called the U.S. Senate. That seems to be gone. Once we get through this process, where does that leave the U.S. Senate in terms of 
the old civility, the tradition, the things that we learned in the civics lessons about our U.S. Senate. Yeah, uh, Frank, a bit of that Washington still existed when you worked in Washington. Forget about it. Just forget about it. Uh, we are more partisan. We are more polarized. There's a lot more bad blood. Uh, both parties are now driven by their ideological extremes. Uh, and so what do you have here? You have Democrats already threatening. Now, Joe Biden so far has not been willing to go along with this. Uh, Joe Biden says he would think about getting rid of the filibuster, but he would rather not. Joe Biden says Democrats would rue the day if they decided, if they win the presidency and they win the Senate and they keep the House, would they try to expand the size of the Supreme Court? Again, that is within their right. That is set by Congress. Uh, Joe Biden has said he doesn't want to do that. But watch Bernie Sanders, watch progressives like you have out there in California, uh, watch progressives across the country. If Donald Trump gets this pick confirmed and Joe Biden wins the presidency and the Democrats win the Senate, there is going to be enormous pressure on them to retaliate, to retaliate. That sounds like a tough word for politics, right? You're supposed to win, you lose, to the victor go the spoiled. Forget about it. There's a lot of bad blood in the water. Democrats are going to want retaliation. Would the new president, Joe Biden, go along? I think that's a giant open question. Mm. John King, uh, Chief National Correspondent for CNN, host of Inside Politics, where you will learn something every day. Uh, Professor Jessica Levinson from Loyola Law School, thanks to both of you for your visit inside the bullpen. Thank you. That's our show for this week, but our political coverage continues online. It sure does. Full interviews of all of our interviews and other inside California politics content are available online. Check out our interview with News Nation anchor Joe Donlin, who takes us behind the scenes of his sit down interview with President Trump. He also has new polling information on the presidential race. We also have a point counterpoint segment on the upcoming Supreme Court confirmation battle in the Senate. Just go to your local station's website and click on Inside California Politics. Nikki, I'll see you next week. And thank you for watching Inside California Politics.